This is an oral history interview with uh, Jerry Griffin, uh, former flight director, flight controller, and former center director of the Johnson Space Center. The date is uh, March 12, 1999. Uh, Jerry, you cut your teeth in mission control during the Gemini program as a flight controller uh, responsible for spacecraft guidance and navigation. Uh, how did you manage to get in on the ground floor of a, of a program like this, and uh, uh, what, what uh, was your secret? It was... Uh not easy. I had actually tried to go to work for NASA in 1962 and the guy that interviewed me was Gene Kranz and Kranz uh, and I couldn't get together on money and so I said to heck with you and I went off and uh, did something else. I went, in fact I went to General Dynamics in Fort Worth uh, but I knew I wanted to get there so bad that uh, finally two years later in 1964 I took a pay cut uh, and went to work for Kranz, actually with Mel Brooks, and uh, started out as an Agena flight controller. And the reason that I did, and that Agena was what we were going to join up mm -hmm. the Gemini with in a rendezvous. And um, I had worked on the Agena at the Satellite Test Center out in California, right after I got out of the Air Force in 1960. And we flew those early flights from Vandenberg, and I knew something about the Agena. And finally, I swallowed my pride and my wallet and came to work in Houston. And um, at that time, we weren't even at the center. We were all over in offices, all over mm -hmm. Houston. And the um, best step I ever made in my life was to do that. The uh, interesting thing, too, was that I only worked the Agena for about a month and then moved immediately to Gemini as a guidance, navigation, and control mm -hmm. officer. Uh, so I actually never worked on the Agena in flight at NASA. Uh, I started out actually as an hmm. Agena, or as a Gemini. Even though the Agena was a real workhorse in Gemini. That's right. And, um, but other people came along, and actually in those days we were short of people. Uh, there was a shortage of flight controllers, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that I did know something, I had been a part of an unmanned space operation, I think was the reason Kranz decided to move me over into the man side fairly fast because I did have some experience. I was a little bit older, albeit not much. I was a little—I was only 30, mm -hmm. but I was a little bit older than some of the real youngsters that we had in the control center then. And uh, so it was, uh, it was an interesting time and the best step I ever made. You—you you kind of alluded to this, but uh, there really was no pre-existing cadre of uh, flight directors. There was no curriculum for flight directors in college. Uh, so if you're Gene Kranz and Chris Kraft trying to put together a cadre of people, a fairly large group, to, to fly all these missions, how do you do it? You know, I think I give most of that credit to the two people you mentioned, particularly to Kraft in the early days and then later Gene Kranz. I think they were both uncanny at picking out people that could respond to this kind of environment. It was very unique. Like I say, nobody had actually been in that pressure cooker split-second decision-making on the ground. Plenty of guys had been in airplanes mm -hmm. doing that. But there was not many people that had, had done it from a ground standpoint where it had to be an instantaneous kind of thing. <clears throat> I think Kraft was uh, particularly adept at testing people in simulations and all of that sort of thing and picking out the ones that he thought could cut it and those that he couldn't, that might not. Um, Gene, uh, I think, got better at that as time went along. And in fact, uh, uh, we, as you, I shouldn't say that, but as you know, we, we didn't have too many washouts in mission uh -huh. control. By the time we got to a real mission, with all the simulations we had done and all the hours we had spent together, it was pretty obvious uh, that the team we had on the floor for the actual flight were all performers. And I had flown in the Air Force um, I had worked the unmanned side with the Gina uh, for the Air Force after I got out. And um, I think I took to it like a duck to water. I, mm -hmm. it, it was a fairly easy transition for me to make because I had been in that split-second decision-making position before. And um, I think the other thing that comes to mind when I think about that is how fortunate I was to be a part of that that organization. Mm -hmm. There were so few of us, and we were all kids, uh, young people. 
with life and death decision making capability probably much before we really had ever been tested uh, with that. So uh, it was a very unique time in a unique setting. Even though uh, a lot of it was just judging personality and, and abilities, there were also some criteria that went into um, the kinds of people they were looking for. Weren't there? Yeah. Yes, there was a, a big criteria, I think, was the fact that we were all engineers uh, or technical people. There right. were scientists involved, too. For the most part, most of us were engineers. So it had to, you had to have a very good technical grounding. Uh, the second thing, I think, is, is the personality trait. It was as close to being a, like a fighter pilot organization as I had ever seen. It, it took a bit of cockiness measured and confidence mm -hmm. measured. Uh, in both cases, if you didn't have the confidence to, to speak up and sp get the job done, you wouldn't last long. Uh, it just, it just mm -hmm. didn't work. So I really think that the, at the end of the day, the confidence and the technical skill was what was the most important aspect. And then the other thing is that final thing of not being bothered by being out on the end of the diving board, ex fully exposed so that all your errors showed up. I, you know, I've, I've often said that astronauts, flight controllers, and all of that, kind of, you know, they, they really didn't mind dying nearly as much as they minded screwing up in, in front of their peers. Mm -hmm. And you had many opportunities in that environment, both in simulations, thank God most of them happened in simulations, but sometimes in real missions where you were out, kind of by, out there by yourself and you had to make that call. And uh, the real fear was screwing up. I've heard uh, <coughs> stories, I don't know if they're apocryphal or true, that uh, uh, early on, uh, probably in Gemini or Mercury, Kraft had a, uh, a bulletin board where it had all of his flight controller's pictures on it. And if anybody screwed up badly enough, there would be a big black grease mark through their picture. I never did see that. I heard that story. Um, Chris was fast to scratch if, if, uh, if he... Uh, and in fact, on at least one or two occasions, and at least one occasion I can remember we talked him out of it, we thought he scratched one mm -hmm. too fast. He had a strong, strong faith in his own intuition. Yes, and, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the time he was exactly right, too. Uh, one of the things, and you also alluded to this, but when visitors come through mission control, even today, certainly true back then, uh, the thing that they would tend to comment on is uh, how youthful all these people were, and uh, almost uh, no other uh, field of, of endeavor will you find young people making those kinds of uh, uh, life and death, uh, uh, nationally significant decisions. Uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, it seems to have been something that, that, that happened almost without a great deal of, of forethought. Those were just the people that were available, they were given the responsibility and trusted with it. And, um, uh, I wonder how that felt as being being a, a part of that kind of a cadre. Well, you know, two things come to mind. One is when I, when it was happening in, in all of that era, I don't think any of us really recognized how significant what we were doing. It, we knew it was significant. We didn't realize, I don't think at the time, how fortunate and what kind of capability did we have to have to ever even get into this position? In many cases, I think, I, I go back again to the analogy of the fighter squadron. You go into a, to a fighter squadron today, just like then, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that always shocks you is how young these people look, and they are young. I mean, these F-15 and F-16s and, and F-22s that are coming along now, uh, these, they look like kids uh, flying them. And I'm sure that, the, that we look that way uh, because in many cases, and, and I've discussed this with Gene Kranz, he was looking for people with flying backgrounds because he thought that skill would transfer and there was no other place to go find them, and he thought that skill would transfer. And so I really think uh, it, we were young, uh, but it was, the, it was a young person's business. Now, the big difference I see today, which is, of course, a big improvement, is that we were all 
guys, all mm -hmm. men. And of course now we have men and women in mission control and should have them. We just didn't didn't have the the skill base uh, yeah. at that time to do that. Yeah, the rest of the country hadn't caught up either. So That's right. We were right along with the rest of the country. The pipeline. Uh, some of Kraft's proteges is that first uh, tier of flight directors: John mm -hmm. Hodge, uh, Gene Kranz, Glenn Lunny. Uh, were all people that you worked closely with. I'd be interested in your kind of thumbnail sketches of each of the, each of those, and uh, what did they pick up uniquely from Kraft? What did they bring to it themselves? You know, the guy that that probably became more craft-like was Lunny. Glenn Lunny uh, had many of the same uh, traits as Kraft. He was quick to make a decision. He was a little blustery every once in a while, uh, confident as, as all get out. And, um, and I always thought that Glenn had a lot of craft look to him and feel to him. Um, Kranz was had some craft kind of features to him, but he was his own guy. As you know, he, mm -hmm. we always call him the Prussian general. He and he had that uh, very uh, military bearing, uh, preciseness uh, uh, that the craft didn't do. Craft, I think, went more on gut feel and in motion, and where Gene was was more of a, of a do it by the numbers, mm -hmm. by the book, by the book. Um, John Hodge. Uh, I don't think matched any of the others. Uh, he came from a different, he was a, a technical guy. Well, Hodge came out of the uh, Canadian Avro, Avro, Avro group. group. And and John brought a different set of skills to the table. He was a very strong technical guy. Uh, and I think uh, operations was not his, his uh, first choice or first love or anything like that. And I think that's one reason he didn't stay in it very long. I think he, uh, he had other talents that, that went to work somewhere else. And, you know, he get, I think, as I recall, he went into advanced programs when he, yeah. when he left, and he was very good. He was a visionary almost. Well, flight operations didn't have much room for visionary. You had to make the hardware work that you, that you had in front of you at the time. So I think John uh, did fine as a flight director, but he just didn't stay in it very long because I don't think it was his bag. But they were all very capable people and all fun to work with. Uh, which which of the bunch, if you were working as a flight controller, a member of the team, uh, which was the, the easiest for you to work with and to work for of that bunch? Oh, I think when I was a flight controller, the guy that I probably related to the fastest, and of course he was an icon to me, even though he probably shouldn't have been, but he was, uh, Craft, I always felt honored to, to work with him you know, when he was a flight director. But uh, Gene Kranz was always easy, and so was Lunny. They were none of them difficult. Yeah. They they were all demanding to the point that they wanted you to be prepared, and that was not an issue in those days. We all worked so hard at what we were trying to do, and as I said earlier, nobody wanted to screw up in front yeah. of their peers. So it was. Uh, the best motivation we had was was uh, the peer pressure. Kranz's organization always struck me as being helpful because he he worried every little issue and problem and communicated them so thoroughly over the loop that everybody knew what was going on. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it got worked over and over and over again. So the, the 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 problem and the approach that was being taken was so clear. Yeah. Uh, Gene was by far the most detailed guy and all that, but he, everybody knew what he was trying to do and, and where, where he was headed. Uh, Kraft and Lunny more gut feel, strong technically also, but had that gut feel that could say, most of the time they knew the answer already. Yeah. So, did, so did Gene. Yeah. Even when I became a flight director, uh, by the time you elevate to that point, you you pretty well know what's going on, but you got those great guys that I, I never had the pleasure of seeing Kraft operating as a flight director, but the one trait that I sensed all of you had from him was the, was the tendency to make the flight controllers take the responsibility for the decision. Amen. That, that is what we learn, all of us learn from Kraft, watching him. He would never, ever try to do your job. Uh, I recall on Apollo, uh, it was Apollo 12 after we got hit by lightning. And I was yeah, I'm going to ask you about that. Okay, uh, maybe I should wait. You know, go ahead. That's fine. Um, I was just going to say I can remember we got hit by lightning right after liftoff, and it tumbled the spacecraft's platform. And thank God the 
Saturn V continued to work just fine. And I was the flight director, and it was my first job as a, as a launch flight director. And I thought we were going to have to abort. I never will forget that feeling. My, my heart was in my throat. Uh, I could, uh, but the training came through. We all, if you, I'd, I've gone back and listened to that voice tape a lot of times, and nobody was ever hurried. Nobody was panicked. Um, first thing I did was I looked at the plot and asked the FIDO, the flight dynamics officer, uh, were we still okay? And we were gaining altitude. And I remember flashing through my mind very fast that, well, if we're going to abort, let's don't abort early. Let's get some more altitude, and we'll just punch off this thing if we have to. Um, to make a long story short, we got uh, we got everything back under control, but the platform was still rolling. The inertial platform that measured your attitude and this was in the spacecraft was in the spacecraft was tumbling. It was it was in a, a gyro gimbaled system, and <clears throat> it was tumbling. And I knew that could damage, uh, particularly when you got under high gravity, uh, high g forces, that you could damage the platform if if you, if it continued to do that. So I asked the GNC, the Guidance, Navigation, and Control Officer, uh, what he wanted to do. I knew what needed to be done. There was a circuit breaker. <coughs> excuse me. There was a circuit breaker you could pull called the IMU break breaker. You could pull that, and it would automatically cage the platform. It would stop it where it was. And he said, "Stand by." And uh, and if you listen to the voice tape, it, you can hear my impatience. I knew what to do. I, knew, I wanted to tell the Capcom, tell him to pull the IMU circuit breaker. But because of Kraft's leadership and training and what I had seen him do in a similar situations before, I just let the situation go on. I figured we were not going to hurt it too bad, even if it, if it kept going. And I'd, So I asked the GNC, I asked him about uh, three or four times. What do, what do you want to do about this IMU, tumbling IMU? And he kept giving me the standby, standby, I'm checking with my back room, blah, blah. Finally, he said, uh, uh, I, well, I said, you best hurry. Because I, I knew we were getting up to the point we were going to be under very high Gs. And he came back to me a minute and said, have him pull the IMU circuit breaker. And then I told the CAFCOM, I said, tell him to pull the IMU breaker. And I was, I was standing up by that time, and I was ready to, uh, uh, just about to scream. But I let him make the call, because I knew that was the way it was supposed to work. How quickly did you realize that uh, the vehicle had been hit by lightning? We didn't get the first hint of it until Pete Conrad uh, said it. He said, and this was after we had at least gotten the power restored back in the... So you were either on orbit or close to it by that time? Yeah, well, it, no, because actually this thing happened about, as I recall, about 50 seconds or so after liftoff. And it, in only about two minutes, we had the fuel cells back online that provided the power to the spacecraft. Uh, incidentally, made on a call by a young uh, flight controller named John Aaron, who I think at the time was 23 years old. Um, so we had, it didn't take us long to get the power restored. We did have systems that were still offline, but we had at least had lights again and all of that. And uh, so it didn't take too long. And then kind of in a quiet part there, uh, Pete said something like, I don't know what happened. I'm not sure we didn't get hit by lightning. And later we found out, even after they got on orbit, that he saw a flash. And, you know, there was a boost protective cover over the windows while the launch escape tower was still on there. So you couldn't see out real well until... That was to protect the windows from getting covered up with that's, soot. That's right. And um, so he... But he thought under all of that he saw a flash. Mm -hmm. And so that's what started us thinking that it may have been a lightning strike. And it's what worried us because uh, at the point that, that when we got into orbit... We weren't sure if we'd fried something back in the back end in the service module uh, because we didn't know where it had hit and uh, the lightning, if it was lightning. They got some quick pictures out of the Cape. I think we might have already even started on our way to the moon by then. They got some pictures out of the Cape that uh, showed some lightning discharges mm -hmm. back down. We probably created our own lightning is what we finally figured mm -hmm. out months later, weeks later. Um, but... Uh, we were afraid we may have fried something so badly that 
we jeopardized the mission. So what we essentially, we took an extra revolution in Earth orbit. We didn't go the first chance we had to go to the moon. We did it on the next chance. Um, and that gave us a little more time. We essentially, in that time, checked out everything we could in the mm -hmm. rear end, um, the service module. Um, and that uh, proved to be a good call. We went on to the moon. We still had that worry about the heat shield. Uh, we had a worry about the mm -hmm. heat shield, and the reason that we did is because we didn't know if it done it, if the lighting had hit right back in that area, it might have cracked it or damaged it or something. And of course, that played out later yeah. during the entry phase with the late. Uh, but it wouldn't have made it any worse if you'd gone onto the moon before coming back and landing right. anyway. That's right. Once we got into orbit, I mean, we had that. Just, you had we to had come that back trip to make later. anyway. That's right. right. Well, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't know how many vehicles have been struck by lightning uh, in launch, but I know of at least two atlases that were struck by lightning that, uh, really? that were lost. One of them a couple of years after, well, several several years after. In fact, it was uh, fairly close to the Challenger. Uh, era after the Challenger accident and an atlas mm. was launched in very similar circumstances at the Cape, hit by lightning and it tumbled the Tumble guidance system and it was lost. You know, we were so fortunate in Apollo 12 that, we, you know, we had the separate guidance system for the launch vehicle, the Saturn, mm -hmm. and then we had the spacecraft uh, guidance system. And during the launch phase, the spacecraft guidance system was just along for the ride. And somehow that lightning, when it hit, got this guidance system, but it did nothing to the Saturn's guidance system. And if it had been the other way around, mm -hmm. that could have been a, it could have been a real disaster, real yeah. tragedy. And uh, so we were very, we were extremely... Well, in fact, a couple of people were in a, in a position, the, the commander, Pete Conrad, and uh, you and the flight controllers, um, to have made an abort call on the yeah. information you had if you had, um, had acted immediately, didn't you? You know, it, we did. It, the thing, as I, as I alluded to earlier, the thing that made that, and, and this all happened, it was happening very fast. And, and, uh, but I, I remember I had two displays on my own console. And one of them was a display that had five circles. It was the five Saturn engine representation. And in the middle of each one, it had a chamber pressure that was read out digitally so that you could see what the chamber pressure was. And as soon as the first hint of something, when he said, uh, I've got a main eight, he started reading off the caution and warning panel, which had just, Pete did, I mean, it just was going crazy. Um, I looked, I remember looking down at, the, at those five engines and they were all still right on the money pressure-wise. So I knew the engines were burning. And I glanced up and looked at the front board and we were gaining altitude right up Flight Dynamics Officer's pre-planned plot. And immediately I said, we don't have to do anything. I was thinking to myself, don't have to do anything right now. We're, we're gaining altitude. We're okay. And, uh, and you know, it seemed like it took forever for John Aaron to get that call back up to say, have him reset to fuel cells. Oh, first thing was SCE to AUX. There was a little switch. SCE was signal conditioning equipment. And there was a little switch in there that you had two positions, normal and alternate, and it was in the normal position. And he had seen a similar thing happen during a pad test on Apollo where he had lost all the telemetry, all the data, and they had gone, the Cape did it, he was just watching the Cape, went to the aux position and it restored it because it put a new line of signal conditioning equipment into the loop. And so he said, have him go SCE to AUX. And when we, and this was a funny time because a lot of this happened on the air path. Uh, mm -hmm. We weren't talking on the radios. He said, SCE to AUX. And I yelled over the top of the console, what? I'd never heard of the switch. We had never touched it, never used it out of all those hundreds of switches. He said, SCE to AUX. So I turned and I said, SCE to the Capcom, have him turn the SCE to AUX. Uh, I said that on the radio, and he yelled back at me, what? <laughs> Same thing I had said, SCE Docs. That was Jerry Carr, I think. And, uh, and so he yelled, he radioed that up, SCE to Ox. 
And Bean knew where that switch was. He, uh, thank goodness. Cause Bean we, didn't say what? Uh, he didn't say what. <laughs> he, he, he had remembered it, and he, as soon as he did it, restored our data. And then we could see, he, uh, John could see that the fuel cells had been kicked offline, and the re-entry batteries were the only thing holding up any voltages at all. And they crew were, was in the dark for part of that, weren't they? Well, they almost the dark. They, the, the lights, the main cabin lights were out, but he still had the caution and warning lights, and there were some other mm-hmm. minor lights. They never did go completely dark. But uh, it was a touch-and-go situation. When I listened to that on tape now, from the time the thing started till the time we had power restored, I think it's something a little less than two minutes. At the time, it seemed like it was forever. Mm-hmm. But all that time, we were gaining altitude. And so I figured, let's don't do anything here until we... It was obvious that the Saturn was steering okay. So, As I recall, yeah. you got the uh, the tape from the internal crew conversations in the cockpit at that time uh, downlink did. very quickly, and you had those in mission control. That we did. Pretty light and uh, I've still got a copy of those, and they're, they're very funny. It, it was a little bit, those three guys were a little bit like, you know, sometime in a car accident or a near car accident when... when uh, you have a close call, and then and you talk about it, and everybody gets kind of giddy, and, and whoo, boy, that was close. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. These guys, between themselves, Pete had that that giggly laugh anyway, and he started laughing. He said, good Lord, he said, I had no idea what was happening there. And yeah, and they were, they sounded like three kids, but it was because of the giddiness of damn near buying it and, and uh, getting by it. Uh, they were also, in a very methodical way, however, among that's all that going step by step, step responding by step. to the ground and putting stuff back online. Getting getting stuff back online, and when you listen to the air to ground voice tape, it was very disciplined, click click. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, I have to say, every time I hear it, and I've listened, had reason to listen to it several times, it kind of makes you proud. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way the the whole thing got carried off and was responded. It's a lot like the Apollo Eleven landing. Uh, you listen to that, and it it will make those team, those team members should have a lot of pride over that. One of the things that, uh, of course, the press pointed out at that time uh, was that uh, President Nixon was in the viewing stands, and there was a suggestion that if uh, if the president had not been there, NASA might have been a little more um, uh, conservative about launching into uh, a solid overcast with lightning potential. Yeah, uh, I didn't buy that. Have any no, in fact, I think that day we learned so much that. It, we had launched in conditions not, not maybe not quite that bad, but uh, in the clouds. We had never worried about that too much. Uh, the uh, Walt Caprian was the launch director, Cappy, and it was his first time as launch director. It was my first time as flight director, and he and I have laughed about it on several occasions that uh, that we were our start in those new jobs were kind of it was a little bit dubious uh, about our ability. I think we would have made that call anytime. I didn't the fact that I didn't never thought about Nixon being there, and I'm sure he didn't either. We just didn't know that a vehicle that big with that ionization capability with all that heat and fire out the rear end could actually trigger, could actually make lightning happen. And I think that's what happened. I think we actually created the lightning strike. And from that day forward as you know, we, uh, we've we never launched again into clouds, and particularly if there's any lightning anywhere near, um, it's a no-go. And we learned that that day the hard way. It was a real tribute, as you pointed out, to the um, Saturn instrument unit, uh, yeah. the IBM-built instrument unit, that yeah. it uh, withstood that and uh, didn't tumble. Yeah, I, I, I w- will not forget I, calling the people at Marshall uh, after we got on orbit and uh, telling them how glad I was that that IU had, uh, instrument unit had held up. Yeah. Before we get uh, too far beyond it, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit also about Apollo 8. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, get your uh, reaction to, to what to a lot of people seems like an audacious decision at that point when we had uh, Never flown the Saturn V with a crew on it. Uh, the Apollo command module had flown only once since it had been very extensively redesigned after the Apollo fire. And yet on Apollo 8, 
second flight of the spacecraft with a crew on it, the first flight of the Saturn V with a crew on it, uh, we say we're going to the moon. Not only are we going to the moon, we're going to go in orbit around the moon. Right. Not just to fly by. Yeah. How did that you happen? You know, I, I get, ever since the Apollo program ended in public and forum and forums and private, I've gotten a lot of questions about what I thought was uh, which mission stands out in Apollo uh, to, to me the most. And I know everybody thinks I'll say Apollo 11 because that was the first landing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. It was Apollo 8, to me, was the biggest step we took. And when we, to, to leave the Earth's influence and to come under the influence of another heavenly body uh, was a big step. And I, I don't, I can remember it was almost, uh, later we got a little better about this, but on Apollo 8, when we did the translunar injection burn, you could have heard, it is the burn that sent us toward the moon, you could have heard a pin drop in that control center. I mean, there was nobody even breathing, hardly. And it was almost like a religious experience. And then when cut off, and the engine cut off, and the trajectory, we did a quick check on the trajectory, and it was good. We were headed out. Um, we all kind of looked at each other and said, well, we've done it now. It's a little bit like the solo you do in an airplane the first time when you get off the ground, and you're really happy, and then all of a sudden you say, good gosh, I've got to get this thing back on the ground again. Um, but it was, you know, it was a very quiet period going out there, and then right after, oh, shortly after TLI, um, Borman got sick. Um, our first thought was that there's something we don't understand about going toward the moon or something. It's gonna it, it it's gonna make them all sick, and we got a disaster on our hands. Of course, that proved not to be true. But um, it was just a it was a kind of a gut check time, mm -hmm. and um, and then I remember when they went behind the moon when we lost signal as they went behind the moon and they were going to do a maneuver back there to slow themselves down so they would go into lunar orbit. Um, I never will forget how quiet that whole room was for that entire, I think the backside took about 50 minutes as I recall, 45 or 50 minutes. And uh, nobody, hardly, nobody, hardly anyone moved uh, that entire time. And when they came around the corner on the other side and started to, and reading out what they'd done, everything's right on, uh, the, the moon looks like this, 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 it's brown, it's gray, it's brown. Uh, great relief, great relief. And then, but we, then we stayed that way, it got a, a little lighter until they were going to do the trans-earth injection burn. And when they went around that corner the last time to do that maneuver that was going to bring them back home, Again, it got very quiet and uh, almost church-like uh, in the control center. I don't think there's any doubt that Apollo 8, it did accelerate the program. I think it allowed us to get the program going. It clearly um, stuck a knife in the Russians, and let's face it, we were in a race with them. Uh, getting men in orbit around the moon at the same time that they were trying to, and then later uh, with their Lunacod uh, later trying to land on the moon. But all in that same time frame, we weren't eating up with that in the control center. We weren't eating up with the, with the uh, coal or anything like that. But it, it made us all proud, and we knew we had taken a step that was going to get us to the moon and land on the moon faster. But uh, I, I was not a part of the, uh, the decision-making process at that time. That happened at headquarters and at the director uh, level and the flight opera uh, director level at uh, Johnson Space Center. Those, that probably took place with, uh, I'd say, three to ten people. I don't know how many were on that, but boy, it took guts to make that call and uh, get us there. Yeah, I think uh, I, I never, except for one occasion, remember Kraft looking visibly nervous and agitated. And that yeah. was uh, when he was waiting for the uh, spacecraft to come out from behind the moon after they had supposedly fired their engine to start them back to Earth. Yeah. And, of course, that was on his shoulders. Right. So he was... Uh, and that was a single-engine 
had to work. And of course, it, we did that every mission after that that went to the moon. But that was one engine, one engine bell, a lot of redundancy in the piping and all that. But there was only one rocket chamber and uh, only one set of fuel tanks, and it had to work, and uh, it did. Thank goodness. And the crew must have had an awful lot of confidence in mission control by that time to trust those sets of numbers to yeah. put them into an orbit that was just 60, 60 miles above miles. the surface instead of 60 miles into it. <laughs> right. In fact, they all said, you know, every one of them said it, the impression they had when they got a look at the moon up close before they went in, that they were going to hit it because they had watched this little bitty circle get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then all of a sudden they were right up against it, and they couldn't see uh, the horizons even. And they all had the feeling they were going to hit it. So yeah, 60 miles is not very far. Did they ask you to double check the numbers? No, they never asked ask us to double check. Uh, I can recall, and I think it was Apollo. I think it was Apollo 14. And I think it was Ed Mitchell that said something about you guys. Uh, uh, you sure you're right with those numbers or something like that? He meant it as a joke, but yeah. but I think the message was there. Well, as I recall uh, from the questions at the time, the uh, crew didn't really get a good uh, visual uh, look at the moon until they got very close to it because of the attitude right. of the spacecraft. That's exactly right. They didn't see, they saw it fairly far out and then once they started getting closer and they got into position uh, for the for the uh, um, injection burn and all that, they didn't see much of it. Uh, and and so it was, uh, it was a leap of faith that we had, and you know a lot of people don't understand, uh, I've explained this to folks, that this problem was a little bit like a, sh a guy shooting a shotgun, shooting play pigeon moving across in front of him, that the moon was in orbit, and our vehicle, we actually had to aim out this way and let, them, let the two uh, collide, uh, rendezvous, if you will. And um, it just intuitively, you think there could be a lot of room for error, and it turns out that we had learned early on in Ranger and some of those Voyagers and things like that. Uh, well, Voyager came later, but some of the Ranger stuff they'd done, we figured out pretty early that we could uh, navigate to the moon. And uh, but it, I'm sure it, some of them thought they were going to hit it. Of course, knowing your precise orbit once you were in orbit was a little different question because you didn't understand the lunar gravity that that well. That's there. right. The lunar gravity is uh, is not consistent, caused by these concentrations of masses, and and we did see some early indications that uh, we didn't understand the moon's gravitational pull as well as we thought we had. But we learned what those were later. Mm -hmm. We find it. Before we get completely away from Gemini, um, uh, that, that program seemed to have a tremendous bearing on the success of Apollo. And I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on what you, you and the flight control team and the astronauts, the operations team, uh, got out of Gemini that, uh, that made Apollo successful. You know, actually when and I, I suppose somebody thought it out this way, but I, when I look back at, at Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, I think we could have just as easily called them all Apollo. Um, it was actually one program. The, the Mercury capsule, uh, and it really was a capsule, all it, about all it did is says that you can put a man in orbit, you can put a person in a pressurized volume, he can eat, sleep, and that was about all Mercury did. I mean, get him through the atmosphere and land him. Uh, Gemini was just kind of a slightly bigger version of, of that same thing, except we learned not only how to stay in orbit longer, but we learned how to rendezvous, and we learned how to do an EVA, an extravehicular activity, and go outside a spacecraft and do work. So when you think of Mercury, Gemini was really then this precursor to a real command module uh, difference in a real working environment. Um, by that time, we had done the major task it was going to take to go to the moon. We'd done EVA, we'd done rendezvous, and we had stayed in space long enough that we, know we, we knew the 10-day ten, ten mission told us we, we were okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Gemini, I think, uh, was a, and Mercury ended just about the time I got 
here. I think they had, I can't remember when MA-9 flew, but it had flown not too long before I got here. And um, Gemini was, was a superb program and a great spacecraft. And uh, it worked well. We had a little, some thruster problems uh, throughout the program. That, and it was always on my systems that I was dealing with. Uh, but other than that, the, the thing worked fine. And it, it, Mercury had worked so well, and Gemini had worked so well, and they were both built by a contractor that was not building the Apollo Command Module and Service Module. And uh, I can recall uh, one of the interesting transitions from Gemini into Apollo was wondering whether we had a contractor that knew how to build spacecraft because the only one that had ever flown had been built by McDonnell Douglas and McDonnell at that time. And so, and, but that proved to be, gosh, I can remember on Apollo 7 when we finally flew the first mission, uh, it was clear that that was a fine piece of machinery and, uh, and worked extremely well. Um, the fire had uh, obviously set us back. Uh, that was no fault of of, uh, of that module, or it could have happened in Gemini, or it could have happened in Mercury even, because we were flying the same kind of pressurized system, 100% oxygen. Mm -hmm. And um, we got kind of faked out, I think, in, in those two early programs, and we're going right on with Apollo just like we had always done. Uh, but I think, I think the flight hardware that we went to the moon with was just outstanding. And the lunar module, uh, outstanding piece yeah. of hardware and it really came to its fore not only when it landed but when it pulled us out of the fire on Apollo 13. Had it not been for the lunar module we, we would have lost that crew and uh, so um, I think all those programs fit together in a nice uh, integrated kind of fashion and I, I like I say I assume somebody sat down and thought through all of that before we did it. I, we were, at, at the time we were pulling it off, it all felt kind of like we were just doing the next step and the next step. And I'm sure somebody was back there saying, yeah, this is going to all fit this big puzzle before it's over. Certainly all fit. Whether, it did. Whether somebody planned it that way or not. Right. Uh, a couple of the things that Gemini uh, uh, advanced our knowledge in was, uh, of course, the rendezvous, as you mentioned, and the um, uh, uh, spacewalking EDA. Yeah. Both of those were not without their difficulties in Gemini. I mean, right. uh, it, there was uh, a period, as I recall, where rendezvous um, uh, was almost counterintuitive, what needed to be done. And right. It, uh, there was some, once, once people understood what was going on, they said, well, of course, uh, Newton's, yeah. Newton's laws of motion explain that. Yeah. But it wasn't apparent to the fighter pilots who were flying those spacecraft at first. Right. In fact, in Gemini 4, uh, McDivitt was trying to, you recall, was trying to, uh, chase the booster, and he kept thrusting toward it, yeah. and which is the worst thing he could have done at the time because of the dynamics of the setup. Um, now, but when we actually got to doing a real, you know, uh, co-elliptic rendezvous, they all worked just fine. Yeah. But it it had to be set up correctly, and yeah. and the training uh, paid off finally. That you can't just start thrusting and manhandle your way into a to a run of it. it's got to be done it's a very delicate maneuver and i'm i'm amazed even uh, today when we've had zillions of shuttle flights with all the rendezvous with the and never one has been blown uh, it just yeah. it just it works yeah now eva uh, was uh, was a bit uh, problematic the the early missions uh, it the was. didn't go well and, and you know there was a reason for that. The Gemini really wasn't designed to be an EVA vehicle, uh, but when uh, Leonov did his thing, uh, the first Russian that did the spacewalk, uh, we kind of, I think, said, "Well, we can do one of those too." It, Leonov didn't do anything much except get out, and that's essentially what Ed White did uh, on Gemini Four. Um, and then later missions, you know, they did do a little better work, better handrails, better foot restraints, uh, actually tried some tools and that sort of thing. Um, and so we learned a lot, I think, by the time we got to Apollo, uh, the Gemini rendezvous, or the uh, EVA work had been very helpful. Mm 
But I'd, you know, we didn't start Gemini with a big EVA thing in mind. It was more of a rendezvous, yeah. long duration, longer duration kind of of, of uh, purpose. But we added that EVA stuff in there, and it worked okay. It was just not easy. It wasn't designed for it. Uh, wouldn't Apollo have been a uh, much more difficult uh, enterprise if you hadn't had the, ron the uh, uh, EVA experience Absolutely. in Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, I think the thing we learned is that you had to have proper foot restraint if you're going to do any work. You had to have the proper foot restraint, and you had to have the proper handholds, and you also had to have the right kind of tools that were easily accessible and easy to use. So, yeah, I think Gemini made... If we, had we not done the EVA work in Gemini, we would have been way behind in Apollo. And, and, and likely, you know, the first real EVA work we did was uh, Apollo 9, uh, where we put the lunar module and the command module in orbit, uh, Earth orbit, mm -hmm. and s separated and then re-rendezvoused and did an EVA and all that. Um, that went extremely well. I never will forget that Dave Scott in his red helmet. Uh, standing up and doing all that work out of the command module hatch, and it was a piece of cake for him. Uh, so yeah, Gemini paid off in lots of ways. Well, by the end of Gemini, um, I had also discovered the training tools of the Zero-G aircraft and the water tank right. to, to simulate, right. partially at least, uh, zero gravity. Yeah, and the, uh, everybody says that the Zero-G airplane, you know, was worth its weight and go many times over in, in terms of a, a successful EVA uh, endeavor. And the water tank, uh, uh, you know, we had one here. We also had one in, in Marshall, and uh, they made big use of, of those. And, uh, and it's one of the best training tools still. What are we doing on tape? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going until we run toward the end of it. I think uh, the next uh, next subject I'd like to spend a little time on is Apollo 13. Um, and we uh, we may have dodged a bullet on 12 with the launch and getting through the lightning strike. Uh, things had gone very well with uh, Apollo 11, Apollo 8, yep. and uh, suddenly I think uh, perhaps the accidents that we had been braced for in uh, Mercury, Gemini, and early Apollo um, uh, jumped up and almost bit us on uh, on Apollo 13. Yeah, you know, the thing that about 13 that I, I didn't think about it at the time, I thought about this in later years, is how fortunate we were that that accident happened where it did. Um, if it had happened after the lunar module had started down for the descent, mm -hmm. it wouldn't even have had to have landed. If it had just been after it undocked and started down to land, um, we would have bought it because um, we needed the limb to get home. We needed the oxygen in it, we needed the water in it, and we needed its propulsion. Now, we never checked out the service propulsion system again um, after the uh, oxygen tank exploded. And it might have worked, but we weren't sure because we knew something had let go mm -hmm. back in the back. Um, so. We were so far, we were 200,000 miles from home, about 50,000 from the moon when, when this thing happened. But thank goodness we still had the lunar module with us. Um, when that accident happened, I don't think anybody at first recognized the severity of it. Uh, you, can re you can hear it in the voice tapes uh, if you listen to much of it again, which I've had to do uh, mainly to review when I was doing the movie Apollo 13 as a mm -hmm. technical advisor. Um, People were still talking about the landing after the, uh, you know, in the early stages, the few, first few minutes after the, uh, they knew something had happened. People were still saying, well, we can't land if we don't do so and so and so and so. So even the first reality check came when they saw the second oxygen tank losing its oxygen. They could see the first one losing it, and then the second one started losing it. And uh, This was with the second of three. Second of three. And uh, so at this point, it was clear that the program 
or the problem wasn't trying to get to a landing on the moon, it was to try to get home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, uh, I, and I've heard it said, we, it was used in the movie, even that this was Na NASA's finest hour. Certainly from the standpoint of mission control and the astronauts and the contractors and all of that working together as a team, I think it was NASA's finest hour because it was a reaction to something that had not been planned. Uh, I mean, we really never had looked at that. We had looked at using the limb as a lifeboat, but it was a very low probability, so we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. And we never thought we'd, A, you have to do it, and B, we never thought we'd have to do it uh, in a situation where we knew it was going to be close. You know, when we first looked, we thought, at the consumables, we thought that, that oxygen was going to be the shortest supply and that that would be what we were going to have to conserve. Uh, turned out that water was our most critical consumable. And we used water to cool things, we used water to drink and to eat mm -hmm. and so forth. But it turned out that, as I recall, I think we had about six hours of water left when we landed back on Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we had flight had been about six hours longer, we would have run out of water, and and, um, and then the thing would have really started to deteriorate. Um, I think it's a uh, not only a tribute to the people, but to the hardware. The command module, even though the fact that the service module had its problem, the command module worked fine the whole time. And the lunar module came through, and, and then the people and the systems all came through. So. I really look at Apollo 13 as, an, as a damn close call, but uh, we learned a lot from it. And it, and again, it was, a, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit of the, this may be a little bit of this measured cockiness I'm talking about. People have asked me several times, were you, in fact, before the people made the movie, they wanted, weren't you guys scared? They, weren't you guys in mission control scared? And I said, no. We all, in fact, they were asking a group of us at the time, and we kind of looked at each other and said, no, we were never scared. We, we had been trained that as long as there are options remaining, just to keep plugging, and it'd be okay. And we never ran out of options. Mm -hmm. We used up a lot of them, but we didn't run out. And I don't think any of us, you know, I've also been asked, did you think you were going to lose them? And no, and that's an honest answer. I really didn't. I thought we could get them back. But I thought we could do anything, and that was kind of our... That was kind of our makeup, is that we thought there's nothing can be thrown at us that we can't figure a way out. Um, now, obviously, uh, there, we knew under powered flight, like the Challenger, there's something happened there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a different story. But if you've given us a stable condition in, in orbit or in translunar travel or whatever, we figured there was a way we could work our way out of it. Um, that may have been uh, a little bit of bravado but it was honest. We really did think we could get them back. And so that's what we set about to do. And I never will forget the, uh, uh, it was, again, Gene Kranz, the Prussian general, coming through with, you know, click, click, click. We actually took his team offline, you know, and let them develop all those power-up procedures and all of the re-entry procedures and all of that. And uh, when they came back in, it just clicked, click, click, right down the line. In the meantime, the other three teams were trying to cut power, cut power, cut power to save water and, and, uh, and everything else. And of course, as an astronaut, I almost froze to death, but we got them home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at the end of the day, it turned out to be a uh, great, it, it was an experience that I just seemed not have had, but, but it was a great experience in, in telling us that, yeah, we could handle some very, very... Jerry, we were talking about Apollo 13. There was one aspect of that mission that also was a first uh, for NASA. And that was it was the first time that uh, NASA management had agreed to let reporters in mission control, uh, where they could listen to the flight director loop and hear all the de decisions and discussions that were going on. And the decision was made before the mission launched. Right. Uh, what, in your view, did that contribute to uh, uh, the fact that this mission, which in many respects was a disaster, ended up being perceived as one of our greatest moments. I don't think there's any doubt that, that having the press in there was uh, a big plus. Um, and I have to admit that early in the, earlier in the program, 
uh, I wasn't sure having the press in was a good idea because I was always a little bit skittish that they would take away, take away the wrong message. I learned, and this is when way back even in Germany is when I was thinking that way. After I became a flight director and dealt with the press a lot, I dealt with them some when I was a flight controller. But when I was a flight director, and the press in those days, of course, we had our tough guys that that took us to task all the time, but they were a very fair bunch. And I think they reported very factually what they saw, what they heard. Um, and I grew, in fact, I've got some of them have been lifelong friends, guys I dealt with in the press that I still uh, am very close to. Um, and I don't know who made that decision. It, I don't know how all it got made. I remember, I, and gee whiz, I don't know whether this is the best thing or not to have these guys in here. But Apollo 13 showed to me it, it was, and I think the later missions uh, where they were in there and when we got to uh, those really, those J missions where we were taking a rover around on the surface of, of the moon and, and doing that, some excellent science and all, uh, having the press right there uh, and no, with nobody filtering what mm -hmm. they were hearing or doing and all that, I think it was great. They could listen to all of our conversations, they knew uh, what, what was happening, and, and uh, so I think I think the uh, having them in there was a big part. Of course, the argument against doing it um, uh, earlier in the program was that uh, you guys who had the responsibility for making the decisions might not make good decisions if you knew you were being second guessed. You might not have a, a full and frank discussion of something. You know what? You know what happened though, and it was very much. You may remember. Um, um, well, I, I know you remember. It, we always had photographers in the control center. Uh, we always had movie guy with a movie camera in the control center. And after about probably Gemini 5, we, we flew the first Gemini 4s when we had the control center up here for the first time in parallel with the Cape. And then on 5, we went to this control center full time. We forgot about the NASA photographers and the movie guys even being there. You never saw them. I never saw Pat Nesky once. Uh, while I was doing the thing. Same thing happened with the press. The first time that they were there, you said, gee whiz, you know, there's Roy Neal or whoever up in there. Um, and it took about probably a day or two and you forgot about them even being there. So it, it was, they were never intrusive. They never bothered us a bit. I didn't say one thing different than I would have said if, had they been there or had they not been there. And uh, so I don't think it had an effect at all, and it opened up what we were doing to the people I call the shareholders of the space program. That's the public, the American public. And uh, so I think it was a good thing to do. Brian Duff was the uh, public affairs director at uh, the center at the time, and uh, he recalled some years later that uh, when he went over with one of the flight directors uh, for a press conference after the accident had occurred, that uh, this individual in starting off the press conference said, ladies and gentlemen, you know everything we know. The only thing you don't know is what we're going to do about it, and that's <laughs> what I'm here to tell you. And I, I'd like to find that in the transcript somewhere, but, yeah. uh, but, it, but it illustrates it, it, the, it the confidence that, uh, that the media had that NASA was telling them the truth because they were there seeing it. They knew that nothing right. was being covered up. Right. And I think right. that may have that had was a lot the to do big, with the credibility. That was the big plus out of it. Yeah. But I, I, I do add the footnote. Maybe it was the time, and maybe it was the people. I think we had perhaps the best group of press that had ever covered any major activity of any kind in this country. Mm -hmm. They, and even the foreign press. The foreign press was very fair to us. They caught us when we were wrong, and they, they lauded us when we were right. So, So I think we had a very unique time, and maybe that period from... I've often said that Apollo in some ways got lost in the Vietnam War and in some of the social change going on in this country. And there was a lot of kind of bad things happening, unpleasant things happening. And the space program were at least these little glimpses of something very positive happening and something that the whole world could understand and get behind. And I think the press, um, in their accurate reporting, caught 
those good parts. Yeah, they caught us in the bad parts too, but but they really emphasized the the good and in the space program kept kind of poking up out of the mud that was going on in the rest of the world with Vietnam and social change and all of that that was happening so fast. And so I think I think our press corps deserves a lot of some of that credit. Uh, going on to uh, to Apollo 15, um, Paul Gast, who was the uh, chief scientist at this uh, center at the time, uh, said after that mission that uh, he firmly believed that if Apollo 15 had been flown before the decision was made, under pressure from the scientific community, to remove Joe Engel, because mm -hmm. he was not a scientist, from the final Apollo flight crew, Apollo 17, and replace him with a scientist, Jack Schmidt, if they had had the experience of seeing how well this team of non-scientists performed on 15, they right. would not have pushed for that decision on 17. Yeah, I, uh, um, and I'm glad we did get a scientist flown, uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm glad Jack Smith got that opportunity. Uh, it was a hell of a hit to Joe Engel. And, um, but you know, our, our crewmen, our astronauts, uh, worked very hard at that science angle. And I think it, it showed, it paid off. Uh, Apollo 15, it's in, Dave Scott was the commander. I was the lead flight director for Apollo 17. And I actually went out into the field with... 15 or 17? 15. Yeah. On 15, uh, I went out into the field on the field geology trips with Dave and, his, and Jim Irwin and the geologist and all that. And this was months before we flew. And the reason I make that point is, is that it, to me, from Apollo 15, 15 on, 15, 16, 17, the purpose of the mission was science, where before our purpose had been primarily to get there, get a little bit of science, and then get back. But by the time we got to 15, we, we felt confident enough in what we were trying to do that, that we knew we could get them out and back with pretty fair assurance. So now let's turn the focus and really turn the heat up on the science. So those last three crews worked their buns off trying to make sure that, that they made use of every minute that they had on that lunar surface. And getting the rover involved, we knew we were going to be able to go great distances from the lunar module uh, for the first time. And, uh, and sure enough, it paid off. I mean, some of the finds that they had, the finds that they had there in, in, the, uh, in those last three missions were extraordinary. And, uh, but it, it was done with a purpose, and, and I think the astronauts responded to it. I know, uh, I think I was, I was the first flight director to ever go out on a geology field mm -hmm. trip with, with the guys that were going to go on the moon. And that was Dave Scott's idea. He said, why don't you come on, Cause, and got Joe Allen, who was the Capcom. And so we had the flight director and the Capcom and the two crewmen, along with all these geologists. I learned more geology in a period, probably three or four months before the launch of Apollo 15, than I'd ever cared to know. Uh, about, but it, and I still remember mm -hmm. it. Lee Silver, great teacher, uh, um, Bill Mulberger, uh, Gordon Swan. Those geologists were just outstanding people, and they they were a delight to work with. And and uh, it paid off. Mm -hmm. We had um, a tremendous amount, as you point out, of geology training uh, for the crews, and um, uh, and yet. Uh, on occasion, they were, uh, particularly early in the program, were very hard pressed to get uh, the flight uh, training that they needed uh, uh, done, particularly on Apollo 11. Yeah. Uh, I think because of the late arrival of the simulators and uh, the software, did that uh, end up smoothing out some in the, the later program? It did. In fact, the, the shuttle mission simulator really got down to be a, a um, I say shuttle, Apollo oh. mission simulator. I'll get straight in a minute. The Apollo mission simulator really became a, a factory uh, operation about the Apollo 11 time frame. It took us a while to get that thing to where it was going to, we could turn it around fast enough. So the training um, elements really did, and all those guys, even the later crews, the Apollos 15, 16, 17, started training pretty early in the shuttle, I keep saying shuttle, Apollo mission simulator. Um, what that did is, is, is they started, those later crews were able to start, 
their training cycle earlier than some of those earlier guys had. Mm -hmm. And that left them more time later in their, in their training cycle to spend on the science side. So, um, yeah, there was a big difference in the training cycle, and it was uh, uh, much heavier toward the science in those later missions. Yeah, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's incredible if you look at the uh, amount of weight of scientific instruments that were carried on the first mission versus yeah. what uh, ramped up to on the, the later J missions, yeah, the, the 15, J 16, 17. Right. Yeah, uh, you had that. Not only did you have the rover and all of the stuff that went with that, uh, all the tools and, and all, but you also had, remember, you had that uh, SIM bay, SIM bay mm -hmm. in the, in the, the uh, in the command, in the service, service module. module where they were mapping the moon from orbit. And that was a fairly, that was a big out, it was a big camera and had a lot of, of uh, weight to that too. So those later missions were, were probably getting very, very close to, to the max that we could push with the Saturn. As we began to reach the conclusion of that program, and, and Apollo 17 uh, was by that time clearly gonna be the last uh, Apollo flight, uh, had you and the flight operations team reached the feeling that um, we had really accomplished about all we were going to get out of Apollo and that uh, uh, to fly beyond that was was risk that was probably greater than the return? You know, in that day, you didn't, it, at our grade levels, you didn't think quite as much that way. You didn't think on the global, yeah. uh, although we were actually in space, but you didn't think on that big basis. Um, we would have, I think all of us would have liked to have flown some more missions. In retrospect, when I look at it, I think that we probably had done about all we could do with that flight hardware. You know, there was people that wanted to go to the Tycho area, because Tycho was a very mm -hmm. a fresh, fresh, bright, big crater and all that, and it would probably be in a very interesting geological uh, mission, and it would. It, it definitely would have been. Um, but we would have shoved that hardware to the limit in, in order to do that, and maybe a little bit beyond the limit. Um, but I think in retrospect, when I look back, at the time, uh, I thought we had dodged enough bullets, but I really now think that, that if all things being equal, we probably pushed that hardware as far as we could. And it would have been fun to fly some more. Uh, on the other hand, I was a little tired. I'd been in the control center for eight, eight years at that point, um, from 64 to 72. And um, it had taken a toll. We were all a lot older at the mm -hmm. end of that. Uh, at the end of Apollo 17, I think we were all pretty tired. We had, uh, it, was, it was a hard, we all were young and we had young families and we were, uh, pushing hard to get it done. We were working tremendous hours. Uh, and it was probably time to have a break uh, from a personal standpoint. And I went off and did other things for NASA, yeah. and, you know, after, right after that. And, well, Apollo uh, certainly had its close calls. Uh, as you mentioned, we had, uh, of course, the, the disastrous fire at the start of the program. Right. Lost three crew members. Uh, then the lightning strike on 12, which could have been a disaster. We lost, what, a parachute landing on Apollo right. 15. Right, um, 13. We had 13 Ten and 13, uh, which was uh, yeah. a near disaster. And you know, so. we, it wasn't a disaster. We almost didn't get docked up with 14. Remember to, to extract the limb from the S-4B? Um, you know, we tried and tried and tried and finally got it. But we could have lost that mission easily. Not Maybe not a life-threatening thing, but we could have lost that mission fairly easily if we had not been able to extract the limb. Um, every one of them had their... You know, enough close mm -hmm. calls that uh, he fed. But, you know, in, at the end of the day, it kind of tells you how good that design, all of those designs were, because we had a lot of redundancy and we had a lot of ways to work around things. And, man, we called it all into play on Apollo 13. I mean, every trick in the book. And, uh, you know, we ran an umbilical a wire um umbilical from one mm -hmm. module through the tunnel to the other one and hooked it up to to get battery power to flow. So it was, uh, uh, the hardware was really well done. And you know, a reflection I have about all that sometime is that I wonder if 20 years from now, or maybe 50, let's say 50 years from now, um, 
people are going to look back, and we did all of that roughly in the mid 1900s, say, just to make it for sake of argument. Um, they're going to look back and say, you know, those people created that great hardware. They did all of those neat missions to the moon back in the mid 1900s or so, and then they did. They stopped, and I wonder why. Um, I think that's going to be an interesting mm -hmm. question to ask. It, it was this little snippet of time where we went to another place, left this, left this planet, went to another place, took place over a little short period of time, and then it just goes on and on. And right. why did they do that? I mean, was it just a Cold War thing? Was it? I don't think so. I think. Um, and I'll ramble here a second, but Neil Armstrong, when, when, we, when we finished the Apollo program, Jack Smith had a fellowship at uh, Caltech, mm -hmm. and he had a little money left in it that he, he had actually spent most of it, but he had a little left. And we had, he pulled together about, as I recall, 25 or 30 people that had all worked on Apollo. And we went out to Caltech and spent about three days uh, contemplating our navels. Basically, what it was, was to discuss what we had done, why we had done it, how did we do it, how were we able to have this little point in history where we could do this. This was right after the mm -hmm. flight of Apollo 17, so it was all fresh in our minds. But none of us had thought about anything majestic like that. We'd all been had our heads down. And Kraft was there, and, and Armstrong, and Conrad, and, and uh, Schmidt, and the geologist, and I was there. I, I may have been the only flight controller there. I can't remember. Um, there were some people from headquarters. Uh, and it was a great experience, because we, you know, none of us had been into anything touchy-feely yet. Uh, we'd been too busy with it. And this was kind of one of those touchy-feely kind of things. Uh, what did we do, and why did we do it? And, how do we do it? And we all had our ideas, and the Cold War was obviously a big piece of that. But uh, Armstrong did something very interesting. And uh, by that time, he was up in Cincinnati, I think, teaching uh, engineering. And he, he got up at a blackboard, and he drew four uh, curves. They looked kind of like mountain peaks. And he had them out all like this. And he had one of them titled Leadership. He had one titled Threat. He had one of them titled Good Economy. And he had one of them, I think was the last one, was Peace or World Peace, something like that. He said, my theory is that when you get all of those curves in conjunction, when they all line up together, you can do something like Apollo. Mm -hmm. Apollo or something like it will happen. And we happen to be ready for that when all of those curves lined up. And uh, he, he kind of stole the show of this whole three-day get-together. And he was right on. I, I've used that several times with younger people in NASA who sometimes get a little discouraged, you know, how long are we going to stay in low Earth orbit and when are we going to break out? And I use that story to, to tell them that you've got to be ready so that when those curves do line up again, uh, that, mm -hmm. that we, as a nation, can, can, can take it on and do it. Um, so to me, that's, that's what Apollo was it's kind of becoming more meaningful to me now that that's what allowed us to have that little point in history. It didn't last too long. You stop and think about it. It's kind of almost a blip. And But what a great program and what a, what a great result in the American and even worldwide spirit that it, that it caused. And I, I know I sound like I'm preaching a little bit here, but I, I really do believe yeah. that, was the, that was the worth of Apollo. That's a good, good summation. Uh, following Apollo, you moved on to a top management job at mm -hmm. NASA headquarters, and uh, interesting time. NASA moved on to the Skylab program. Right. Uh, uh, as I recall, you were in legislative affairs initially, right. like working I ran, in Congress. 
I went up and ran the Office of Legislative Affairs at NASA headquarters, and um, it was interesting because I was the first non-lawyer to do that. Uh, I was uh, also knew so little about Washington. I knew the Senate was on the left and the House was on the right if you were standing on the mall side of the Capitol. That was about the extent of my knowledge. Uh, I literally got a civics uh, textbook called How Laws Are Made and studied it mm -hmm. so that I could figure out how, you know, r brush up on all of that business. And actually my job there in the early going was not Skylab. Skylab was already well along its way, but it was to get the shuttle mm -hmm. pinned down and, and, uh, and make it stick. This was 1973, and it had received its first funding in 71. But Mondale had almost killed it the year before, came within one vote of killing it in the Senate. And um, they wanted somebody that understood the technical side of the equation to deal with the Congress. And that's why I went there. And, and I did it for four years, and I was ready to get out. <laughs> But it was a fun four years, and it kind of broke me out. The thing it did more than anything is it broke me out of the pack. Um, mm -hmm. I was no longer just a flight director. I was somebody then that had been to Washington, and that led on to other things mm -hmm. uh, that came later. You were probably a, a good case uh, case study of the, uh, uh, let's see, what was the guy's name? Uh, Rufus Miles, Miles Maxima. Uh -huh. Where you stand depends on where you sit. That's right. And, uh, That's right. I suspect your perspective of going from a field center to headquarters into that kind of job changed uh, quite a bit. You know, it changed my it changed a lot, but where it really changed was my view of JSC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we and rightly so. We, JSC is a very uh, cocky kind of organization. It had always been kind of a. Uh, I think our feeling was we were. Amongst all of these other equal centers, we were better than they are. And uh, that's not a totally bad assessment. But I also figured out that there were other centers in NASA that also had some very special skills and some extremely capable people. And it changed my view, therefore, not only of JSC, but it changed my view of the agency. And, um, and I, it, it was an eye-opener that, yeah, I had worked with Von Brown and his troops over in Huntsville, and I'd worked with Debus and his guys at the Cape, but they were kind of, you know, they weren't like Gilruth. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so it changed my it changed my perspective of the agency, and and then I went on to be the deputy director at in the desert at Dryden, and then the deputy director at the Cape, and and I think I was really fortunate to have those experiences before I came back here to be the center director because. Mm -hmm. Then I really did have, I felt like I had, and I still feel like I've got a good feel for the agency and what they do in different centers, and, and it, was, it was just educational. How would you um, characterize the, the centers and headquarters that you had uh, uh, direct dealings with as far as their, their personality or their, uh, their culture? But by, by far, the, um, the most... Uh, what word do I use here? Kind of snooty. Um, JSC came across as pretty, pretty snooty bunch, uh, and and of course I knew all the people, and I could, I was able to soften some of that mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but we, you know, the, we were kind of like the Yankees. Uh, we had, we'd won a bunch of pennants in a row. I think the other centers chafed a bit because JSC quite often got the ink, got the coverage, and quite often it was the Cape or Marshall that was maybe strongly behind something that had worked very well, but JSC was where the press really came and camped out. Now they camped out at the Cape too, mm -hmm. but that, that became pretty much of a launch system thing and then it was done and then they all came over here and were here for the duration of the mission. This is where the astronauts lived and trained and blah blah blah. Um, but I found the other centers, uh, and JSC wasn't bad, I probably overstated that a little bit, but the other centers did resent, and I suspect there's still some of that there, did resent uh, JSC's stature amongst uh, 
the agency uh, waterfall, mm -hmm. if you will. It always seemed like JSC was up here and rather of a kind of catching the, the, the dribbles. But I really do think that at, at the end of the day, what I learned is that all of the NASA centers had these unique skills. I mean, I went to JPL for the first time after I had gotten up there, and I was, you know, they got control centers, and mm -hmm. they go to places like Saturn and, and folks, places like that. We hadn't been at JSC. Um, I went to Ames and looked at some of the simulation capability they had there with big airplane stuff and spacecraft. Uh, they do the shuttle now. Mm -hmm. um, every center had its Langley. My gosh, you know, the capability those guys had back at Langley was just, I'd never seen it. I'd never been there. And uh, so I think uh, all of them were, the center directors were an interesting group, as you know. Mm -hmm. Most of them are, uh, got fairly big egos. And uh, some of them are easy to work with and some of them aren't. Uh, and I've worked with some that were almost impossible, and I, I won't name them all, <laughs> but, but, and then some that were pretty easy. Um, uh, I had a real easy connection, obviously, to JSC when I was up there, because uh, well, this is where I grew up. So, and I, it, took me, it took me a little while to get into the Huntsville crowd. And the, uh, when you came back uh, in 82 as center director, uh, did you have any plan in mind, or did, did you consciously try to change the, the center's culture? Yes. Um, I knew that would not be anything that could take place overnight, and I knew it was not something that in the time that I had, uh, which I didn't know how, how long I would have, but I knew I could not change it entirely. But I did try to do some things that... To try to soften some of that reaction that I had seen um, when I was away from the center, and I did that in a couple. Tried to do it in a couple of ways. One is uh, putting the right kind of people in the right positions that were savvy and I could talk to, and and uh, and then the other thing was just to uh, I got I had gotten to know a lot of people at the other NASA facilities, and I spent quite a bit of shuttle diplomacy. Um, trying to make sure that they understood that JSA wasn't trying to dominate all of NASA. In fact, we couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, that came to the foreground mainly in the, in the space station arena. Uh, and, and this is, and I'll, I'll tell the story right now, one of the things that, that happened is that, of course, NASA had not had a new big start for a long time. And, uh, and here came this, down the pike, this this idea of a space station. And uh, Beggs was the, the uh, Jim Beggs was the administrator, Hans Mark was the uh, deputy. And, uh, and then we had some very strong center directors at the other centers. Um, and when this thing started to take form that, that we were going to have another big start, every center wanted its piece of the action. If you ran out the numbers that we were talking about, uh, the program wasn't as big as Apollo. I mean, in, in it, mm -hmm. where we'd had a lead center run the thing, and I, <laughs> I guess because of my experience, Beggs and Mark turned to me and said, "Jerry, we want you to be our uh, team leader and work with all the center directors to create these work packages so that we could break the work up into pieces and give some to Marshall and some to." Langley and some so forth. Um, my first push on that was, let's don't do that. Let, let's. Why don't we give it to one center? Uh, it's not that big a program. It, it's it's big, but it's not any bigger than any single center could handle. And I even and I and I said that ought to be GSC. We know how to do this. We've done it in Apollo and so on. And that kind of immediately got read as I was trying to back to the old. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I, I even made the appeal, if you don't give it to us, give it to Marshall. If you don't give it to Marshall, give it to Langley. Don Harth, who was their center director, uh, I don't want it. <laughs> but uh, uh, I really felt that it was not a good idea to break this thing up into so many little pieces and then have a terrible nightmare uh, trying to pull it all together. 
But I did get on uh, old NASA 1, or NASA 2, I guess it was, and flew all over the country to different field centers. And I really did feel, I felt a little bit like Henry Kissinger, uh, shuttle diplomacy back in the days he was Secretary of State. Because I had meetings, sometimes I would have a meeting in Washington, Huntsville, the Cape, in the same day, or Huntsville, Langley, Lewis, in the same day. And uh, trying to say, look, why don't, in, in this little pie we were trying to divvy up, didn't make any sense at all. Uh, you know the history of that, mm -hmm. probably, but it, it, it turned out it was, it was a very tough management arrangement. And I think it probably still is, uh, although it's better. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think the agency at that time really ever did come to grips with that issue. Yeah. And the station did end up fractionated and split up among too many. Uh, I really think one else. center could have handled it. And, and politically, mm -hmm. it may not have been possible to do that. Maybe so many people in the Congress by that time had gotten their piece of the pie that they would. But I, I really think the, the job could have been done faster and easier giving it to one center and say, get it done and use the rest of the centers or the other centers' uh, resources where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Power, maybe at Lewis and propulsion at, at uh, Huntsville and so forth. Mm -hmm. Science at JPL and Goddard and Ames for, I don't know. But I think a center could have done that better. I've always had the feeling that headquarters is not the place to try to run a program. It's too distant, it's not far, it's, it's not close enough to where the action is. It's too far removed from the contractors. I really think the field center, and I've said this a lot, NASA has great, great strengths. And where those strengths are is in the field centers. It's not inside the beltway. I could go hire almost anybody to do the job that is required, and that, that will not be a popular statement, but I could almost go to any agency in the federal government and get the headquarters job done. What I can't get done is anywhere else is the job the field centers do, and that's where NASA's talent is. And I've been to headquarters twice because I went back there as a head of external relations, and it's a very essential piece of the puzzle, but it ain't nearly what it takes to run one of these field centers or to do the job these field centers do. So I, I, I didn't leave because of that. I left because I, I got bought out by somebody that made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Uh, so I took early retirement and, and did it. But it, I, don't, I still think there is too much emphasis in the headquarters function an, it's a necessary function, mm -hmm. and it's an important one. But um, although Dan Golden has cut headquarters significantly, well, what, I'm glad to hear that. Was. I'm glad to hear that. One of your headquarters uh, uh, duties uh, in that last uh, last tour was the uh, transition from the uh, Carter administration to the Reagan administration. Actually, I didn't think about you remembered that. Mm -hmm. It sure was. Yeah. That was an interesting time. That was probably as political as I ever had to get. I learned how to get political fairly fast uh, in Washington, but you know NASA still had kind of an apolitical mm -hmm. grounding in it, and and NASA didn't have to live in the politics like a lot of the other agencies did. It was in it, but not like nearly like Labor or uh, HUD or some of those outfits. Um, but when I worked the transition team um, from Carter to Reagan, th that was the first time I really I, I felt caught in a vice a couple of times. Although it worked well because Hans Mark was coming in and Jim Banks, who I didn't know at the time, but I really, really liked uh, eventually. Um, it, it was an interesting time, and uh, and I figured, and, and I also considered it a great honor to uh, be a part of that. What uh, changes, if any, did it uh, did it make in the agency? Could you note any uh, any fundamental shift in policy or uh, not so much? In you know what I well, I think what I noticed first, um, Bob Frosch, and then after Bill, uh, the guy that succeeded, you know, we'll, we'll get that for the record. Bill, in very short time, 
before we got Beggs in. Anyway, he, he was a guy that, that succeeded Bob Frosch. Well, Alan uh, Lovelace filled the gap, and then uh, well, after Frosch resigned. Well, no, this was even at, okay, this was before Lovelace. Ah, anyway. Um, okay, it's not coming to me either. Frosch and, and, uh, and then later this bill, some, and, and, uh, and Lovelace um, were all three different. And, and uh, Frosch, you know, Frosch was a very uh, bright guy, very mm -hmm. uh, brilliant sort of guy. Not a very much of a hands-on kind of guy. Lovelace was exactly the opposite in that respect. He was, he was very much a hands-on. He was the deputy administrator. He was the deputy administrator, yeah. and he, but he was a very much hands-on guy. Uh, Beggs came in, and the difference I saw was that Beggs came in and didn't really know NASA very well. He'd been with General Dynamics uh, off in other, not the space side of it. So Beggs was an open mind, an open book to some degree, although he Jim had some ideas that he wanted, and he kind of tried to cram them down our throat, and he finally backed off of that a little bit. But we had Hans Mark, who had been a NASA center director. Mm -hmm. And I think Hans uh, really understood the field center role. In the, and that's what I saw different uh, in, that, in that changeover, was the fact that here was a guy. And you know, the deputy administrator has always been kind of the general manager of the agency. He's, he's the guy that's out there all the time with his hands on, on the pulse. And we had a guy that really did understand the NASA field centers and, and what their strengths and weaknesses were. And make no mistake, one of the reasons I got selected as to be the next director here is that Hans, I think, particularly wanted somebody here that had had some experiences outside of JSC to kind of take that edge off of, of what I was talking about earlier. So Hans was really responsible for me coming here as the center director, and uh, and I enjoyed working with Hans. He was a he was a good guy to work for. What um, what have your um, in your experience as a center director uh, from about eighty two to eighty five? Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things were the most rewarding and what were the most uh, uh, challenging from your point of view in that period? Well, you know, the thing that was probably the most rewarding was the performance of the shuttle. Mm -hmm. um, it, and in fact, I got here, uh, STS-4 had just, I guess had just flown, yeah. And, um, but we ripped off those, those next several missions and, and the shuttle was just, and we were bringing in new vehicles new orbiters and uh, the process was going extremely well. That was very gratifying. The other thing we did here is that that I thought was a kind of a milestone is that we we started a change in getting away from what I'd call the the final end of kind of the old style of doing business like budgets and, and all that. We got to a more modern uh, approach and <laughs> I never will forget when I first got here, and I, I sat through a budget session over here in headquarters building, the first one, and it took all day. Mm -hmm. And when it was all through, I might have understood a tenth of it. It was in such detail and in such laborious uh, line item detail. And, and I stopped that. I said, hey, no moss. I cannot listen to this anymore. We've got to get something that's better so we can understand it. And it, it was all a, uh, a fragment or a part of the fact that the way we had to report it to headquarters. And I said, I don't know how you care how you report it to headquarters, but make sure I can understand it. So I think it was a change in that regard. Mm -hmm. But the other big thing was getting the station off the ground. I did, although I didn't agree with the work package thing, we got it started. Yeah. You know, again, remember the old yeah. program office and the A's and the B's and, right. and so forth and the C's? We got that all, and I spent, a, I probably spent the last two years I was here, I probably spent half my time on that. I was flying to every center, like I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. and spending a lot of time on that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, I left, uh, actually I left on January 14th of 86, 
Okay, just after the first of the year. And, and uh, it was only two weeks later that the Challenger accident mm -hmm. occurred. And um, so I started off with saying I was so proud of the way the shuttle had operated, and it had done superbly up to then. Uh, and then, of course, right after I left, it had been gone two weeks when the Challenger accident happened. It kind of took a lot of the the fun, I guess, out of of uh, of what I would say is the number one thing that sticks in my mind that we got done. In terms of problems, you know, interestingly enough, one of the things that I had, and I never would have thought it, uh, that I would have had to spend as much time in as I did, and that's with uh, disgruntled astronauts. Mm -hmm. Astronauts who thought they should fly before the other guy. And they would run their traps as far as they could with all of their own management, and I would always be at the end of the of uh, the, uh, the final appeal, if you will. And uh, every time I, I'd go in the morning and if I, basically what do we got on the calendar today and if she'd tell me that astronaut so-and-so, whoever that is, wants to s see if he can set up a time to come see you, I knew what it was about before he ever came in and I always had my pat answer, which was, I don't make crew assignments. But I'd have to listen and cajole and Mm -hmm. and uh, commiserate with them and so yeah 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 I know but I spent a lot of time with with astronauts I also had some some of my best remembrances of some astronaut friends that and one of them that comes to mind is Judy Bresnik who as you know was killed on Challenger um, Judy was single and and uh, so my wife and I would occasionally have her at, at holiday time or something like that and uh, and Kathy Sullivan, and, and there was there were just some really neat people that that I that uh, I recall being astronauts that were fun. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, Chris Kraft mentioned was that uh, <clears throat> when he took over as center director from Bob Gilruth, uh, he he said he felt that um, the astronaut function was really being managed with too little input from the center director, and that was one of the things he'd tried to uh, and felt he had changed is to insert. The center director into some of those crew right. decisions, and uh, uh, I would expect that in your case, uh, your close association with most of those astronauts in the flight operations realm uh, made that it, transition it a little easier. And there's no doubt too that that one of the things that, we're, and I think we're, and I'm not sure what Chris meant by that, but I think I did. I was heavily involved in the policy that said this is how crew assignments should be done mm -hmm. and but even at that you would always you could come up with all the criteria you could come up with who flew last and all. there would always be two or three that you could probably flip a coin mm -hmm. and they probably ought to be the guy that would go or the gal that would go next and um, and it was those kind of things where it, when it happened that they would want the final appeal but I, I never did undo any crew assignment or anything, because I, I knew it. I was always mm -hmm. briefed on them and why and right. so forth, so I, I knew what they were doing. But it was, I never would have thought it. I just wouldn't have thought it. Let me say something about Chris um, that's important here, that one of the things that made my transition into here is easy. It was, I was one of Chris's guys. Uh, when Chris decided to step down, um, it was really, I think, a very unique handover. Uh, I had followed him most of his career, as particularly since he, or when he came to MSC and then JSC. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew how he thought and I knew what he had done, and and there were so many things that were done exactly the way I would have done them anyway. Uh, and but I changed a few things. One of the things I changed was the organization. Uh, I thought Chris had too many direct reports, too many people, uh, as I recall, there were 17, I think, or 17 or 18. And um, I just thought that was too broad a span of control. Uh, I didn't change any of the people's functions, but if you recall, I, I don't know whether you remember that, I, I, do. I did some things where I was trying to group some things that with some leaders that had some muscle uh, so I didn't have to try to integrate 17 different inputs. Now some people like that and I think Chris is a little more aimed that way. He, he likes to be that final integrator and keep all the people guessing. But uh, 
Chris was so, let me say, kind and open and helpful uh, when I first came in here. Um, I came back, and I'd been gone almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I left in 72 and came back. Uh, I left in uh, late 72 and came back in early, well, spring of 82. So it had been nine and a half years I had been gone. So there was a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of things had changed. And, but Chris really did make it easy for me to to get my feet in the stirrups and, and start riding a horse pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was very grateful for that. You mentioned that uh, the Challenger accident occurred a couple of weeks after you had, uh, mm -hmm. had left, uh, although you were very closely involved with the shuttle program up mm -hmm. to that and I'm sure had some insights and observations as uh, that process was unfolding. Um, do you think that the uh, Rogers Commission that uh, conducted the hearings on the Challenger accident uh, pretty well got the right sequence of events and uh, causes of that accident uh, identified? I think so, although I, and this is based strictly on a gut feel. Um, I think the temperature aspects were probably over done. I have a feeling we would have lost that vehicle on a summer day. So you don't really think that the decision to launch in the cold was uh, as, as crucial as it might I have I think appeared. it was a bad seal. We knew the design was close. Mm -hmm. It was marginal. And we were working on a, an improved interface between the segments. Um, but we'd flown lots of things and gosh, clear back to, in my in my time frame, Gemini and Apollo, uh, Skylab, we had flown things that we knew design was, you know, we wish it was beefier, yeah. we wished it was, but we thought it was okay. And uh, so I really think, you know, they had trouble making that seal at the Cape. They went through mm -hmm. quite a lot of detail, how many times they had to make it and unmake it. And the design wasn't real easy to, you could make a mistake with it. You had to be careful. And then there was no way to really test it once you got the design. And then, you know, they added the second O-ring and a, and a uh, pressure port, easy yeah. solution to make sure that you had a seal. Um, and I think they, I think they, the, it was a bad joint. Mm -hmm. And I just have the feel, I have the feeling that we could have launched it in July and it, it would have still failed. Um, so I, I think the temperature thing was probably overblown a bit. But that, yeah. again, I, that's my personal opinion and it's not based on any great sure. fact. I just think it was a bad situation. Well, the solid rocket motor in retrospect is one of those things that a lot of people said they wish we had never had to add to the shuttle and that was one of those compromises that came about right. while you were in Washington yep. to uh, uh, keep costs down or cut costs. Um, and uh, I'm wondering how much of a, of a factor that was and how much did we really understand those solids until uh, prior to the accident. Well, you know, interestingly enough, though, the solids had have have always had a good safety. Uh, I'm just talking about solid rockets in general. Yeah. Have had an excellent um, safety record. They've been very reliable. And when we went to the solids, I I didn't think that was all such a bad deal. I thought that was probably okay. I didn't know a lot about them because we'd never flown anything with them on there. And by that time, I'm up in Washington worrying about things other than propellants. Uh, but I, I remember thinking, that, well, that sounds like a, probably a pretty good trade-off. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think in retrospect that, that uh, the sense of security or confidence that people had in the solids was due to the fact that uh, uh, they, they were looking at them in a, uh, from a standpoint of an unmanned system as opposed to a manned system? Probably there may have been some of that. There's also, I think, it, it's a little bit analogous, I think, to the 100% oxygen environment in a cabin. You get lulled uh, mm -hmm. uh, by success uh, into thinking that, that something is good because it's been okay in the past. And and uh, might have taken our eye off the ball a little bit. Uh, I, however, I think at the time, that joint design and the guys that were assembling it were probably the best we could do. It just wasn't good enough, and it was that, that simple. That's why I think we lost it yeah. even on a hot day. Bob Crippen uh, made the observation, I think, before the Rogers Commission that uh, from his perspective, one of the uh, things that had happened leading up to that accident was that uh, 
NASA had quit asking the question, uh, prove to me that this vehicle is safe to fly, and had started asking it, prove to me that it, it is, is not, not safe. Right. You, you agree with it, that? I, you know, I was not involved in that, in that decision, particularly on that flight, mm -hmm. but uh, to go. Uh, but I, I can see how I think that could happen. Um, we were trying to make the shuttle more operational. We were trying to make it more of a check it out and go without this exhaustive um, set of things that we had done ever since Mercury. And I think we learned, and we weren't doing that to cut corners, we were trying to do it to make the system more like a, like a real operational mm -hmm. system. And I think we learned out of that process that, that you can't, with these kind of systems, with these kind of energies, stored energy involved in releasing it so fast, that you, re you really can't be that kind. Now, if we can ever get to a horizontal takeoff and landing and some kind of engine that burns liquids all the time, you know, maybe we can get to more operational kind of space flight. But with the technology that we've got in the shuttle, which is, you know, it's early 70s stuff, primarily with boosters, um, where we can't, we can't make it any more operational than it is probably today, which is not real operational. Where do you suspect the uh, technology will go in the next 20 to 30 years? Uh, 20 to 30 years, uh, I think we're going we're, we're gonna to see some sort of X-33, 34 kind of vehicle. Um, horizontal takeoff, landing. Um, 20 or 30 years may be a little short. It may take longer to get there than, than what I'm thinking for an operation. I'm so that would say the shuttle really is likely to be the primary man vehicle 20 for years. another 20 years. I think so. How do you think history is going to judge the shuttle? Uh, I think it's a, going to judge it extremely well. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it has just passed recently um, the record for any launch system mm -hmm. in terms of success rate. Um, I may be wrong on that, no, but I think, I, you're right. I, I think I read somewhere that it, had it passed the Delta and it, then it passed something else, and I think now it is the most successful of any vehicle ever, that's ever been launched. It's got the most, it's got the highest success rate. And um, I don't know how you can get any better than that. Yeah, I think the, uh, the criticism that will probably continue to be leveled against it is that it didn't meet its promise. Uh, NASA at one point was saying it will fly 60 times a year and reduce the cost by an order of magnitude and we let just me, didn't let do me, that. I've got a theory on that because I was in the middle of that and I remember when those claims were being made and it was mostly in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember kind of, whoa, you know, I wonder if they really think that's right because by the time I got in there, 71, is when they got the first funding. I got there in April of 73. And I had not been, I'd been flying Apollo, so I hadn't been worrying too much about the shuttle. But I thought, boy, that is a big leap. I remember, I, I remember thinking to myself, can we do that? Uh, but I even, you know, I listened to all those guys come in up there and say, they, yeah, they could. But it really was, I believe, a primarily headquarters driven political message. That and not that they did it. Uh, uh, they thought they really could do it, but you didn't hear the you didn't hear the guys in the field centers mm -hmm. standing before the American public saying we're going to fly this thing, you know, as many times and as easy as we, we as we could. But I think everybody just assumed that we could make it a lot easier, and it, it was and it was not trying to mislead anybody that they. This system should be able to be better than a, than the old Saturn, and yeah. indeed it is. But it never could, from the get-go, was never going to get to where people were claiming it well, would. The shuttle was designed by the Apollo team, really at the peak of that team's capabilities and accomplishments. Do you think that maybe that contributed to a sense of overconfidence in what they could do? Probably. I think it probably did. And, and the thing that, that is... Uh, Kind of the if the footnote the footnote to that is is that there wasn't anybody else in the country that could have done it. Mm -hmm. Those were the people that had the skill to do it, and so I don't really fault. I think they thought they could 
change this thing in order of magnitude. And what they did is changed it, you know, about 10 to 20 or maybe even 50 percent. But they couldn't get the order of magnitude that they, that they thought they could. And I mean, I got eaten up with the same story. I, I, I was mm -hmm. up there telling people on the hill, oh yeah, we can fly that again. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess we can, so let's do it. Well, there were also political and legislative trade-offs that were made that, that changed the ability to do that, and I'm not sure those ever got factored in. No, that's right. And, but at the, and I was in the, in the, as I said earlier, right in the middle of that fray in Washington. I don't think anybody was trying to intentionally mislead anybody. Mm -hmm. We really thought we could do it. And uh, well, one of the reporters that you'll remember well, Bill Hines, uh, wrote an article at about that time, uh, pointing out that uh, the numbers that NASA was using were bogus, as he put it. He compared it to the uh, supersonic transport. So the supersonic transport looks great, but only if you f build enough of them and fly enough flights do they get you get the cost down. And he, he predicted the same thing would happen with the he shuttle. Was, he and was unfortunately, right. I think he was right. Yeah. Yeah. And one other uh, uh, thought along those lines, uh, Gilruth and Kraft uh, really in, in a way had a kind of a paradoxical uh, concept of returning to the moon. Uh, as I remember it, Gilruth said that uh, people will never realize how difficult it was to do it the first time until they try to do it again. Right. Kraft has said repeatedly that uh, we won't do it again until it's easy. Hmm. And uh, in a way, uh, you know, I wonder if, if uh, both of those could be right. They, I, I, that was going to be my reaction. I think in a, in a way they're both right. I can see the point. But it, you stop and think about what it takes to get to the moon. And it, it is kind of mind-boggling. Uh, how much energy you have to add. If you take any of anything of any size out there, it, there's a lot of energy that has to be uh, added in a fairly short period of time, which is always dangerous. And then so many things can go wrong. Uh, and you're out there 250,000 miles from the earth and, and uh, what you got is all you got with you at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, I, I do think there are some, the technology today would probably make it no harder to do than, than what we did in Apollo and probably make it easier. I think we can make some things lighter, we can make some things uh, a little more capable uh, of fault tolerance and that sort of thing. So. Um, I think I think we're we're gonna we will go back to the moon, and uh, when those curves get mm -hmm. in the right perspective again, um, but it's I don't see what's going to drive us to do it right now. That's that's the thing that's I think there's no there's nothing to make it happen. There's nothing to push it, um, and maybe we shouldn't go back. Maybe we ought to go on to Mars. Now you talk about a tough mission. I mean that's a really tough one. But if we uh, if we would undertake that one and, and and with the resolve to get it done, I'm sure we could do it. You mentioned earlier on the um, the psychological impact of um, making a fairly short burn in Earth orbit that commits you to going to the moon. Yeah. What was that about a four minute burn? Yeah, as I recall, I think it was about four minutes. four minutes. How much longer of a burn would you have to have to commit you to, to a two year trip to Mars? Not much. Uh, not a lot. Not a lot more energy. Yeah. Uh, just takes you longer, yeah. and uh, the trip at the trip, yeah. and uh, the last numbers I've seen, they've got that down to about uh, ten month transit time each direction, mm -hmm. uh, with certain assumptions, and uh, so who knows? Maybe that maybe that's what we'll do next. Be a big psychological uh, would. Uh, effect to see the Earth diminish to a point of light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Take twenty minutes just to get a conversation out yeah. there. I think that uh, Well, this is up, excellent. I, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to uh, be a part of this. Well, we may want to get you back. We'll uh, look over the transcripts and think of what we be should glad. have asked and didn't. And be glad uh, to do that.